We're gonna start. Um, so good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer. Um, I'm here with AZ Assessable. And tonight we have a great um, fireside chat with you with Taryn from Extra Wealthy Moms to discuss um, just the perspective of a parent and how we can collaborate and work together. Um, so I'll be moderating. So Taryn, feel free to introduce yourself. Thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Taryn Laganegro. Um, I co-founded an organization called Extra Lucky Moms. And our goal is to create a community platform for parents of children with all types of disabilities. Um, I'll get into the why um, in a little bit, but um, that's a little bit about, about me. I'm mom to four girls. My youngest daughter was born with Down syndrome in March of 2020. Um, so that's what started to uh, head me in this direction. <laughs> um, and I'm also a, uh, I own a yoga studio. I'm a yoga teacher and meditation coach. Uh, so I have a background in uh, promoting self-care. Um, so that's a little bit about me. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think definitely after the pandemic and we need a lot of self-care. So um, we look forward to kind of hearing your perspective. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, so feel free to go ahead Okay, so I'm going to yeah. share some. Let me know if you can see that okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, um, we founded Extra Lucky Moms just to create um, a platform for parents to talk about a lot of different parts of disability parenting. Um, having a child with a disability can increase stress and just, there's a lot of things that go into it that, um, that people don't often think about from finding appropriate and affordable childcare and decisions that you have to make personally about working, um, the, the future in education as our children get older. Um, there's a lot of different factors. So what we've found that really helps the, reduce the stress is finding community and connection um, among parents who are dealing with similar things. Um, finding and knowing how to ask for tangible support. Um, it's easy to offer support to people um, you know, verbally, uh, but there's some ways that you know, we like to promote um, parents with a child with a disability being supported that is real help for them and can take the load off. Um, and then we also are big proponents of respite. And I'll talk a lot about that, that later because that looks different for everybody. And the, the point of us promoting it is not saying that there's one way that works for everyone. Um, and there's a lot of different factors that go into that as well. So just some of the points that we'll talk about tonight. So community, the big thing about community is just level setting the playing field sometimes. So, you know, some of the thoughts that can come up when you get a, a diagnosis for your child is why did this happen to me? Everyone else's parenting journey is so easy. Nobody understands what I go through and I feel alone. So knowing that people out there are going through similar things and sometimes even just simple things, like things that you don't think about as much, but maybe just someone who understands that you have a lot more appointments than the average parent, um, or just understands that you can't just go and leave your child with, with anybody and go out with friends. Um, so just you know, knowing that there's someone there who understands can decrease that feeling of isolation. Um, and then also there's people there who understand the celebrations that don't seem as big to other people. So um, we often say like those little tiny milestones that we, we maybe, I had three neurotypical children before I had my daughter with Down syndrome. There's so many things that they did that I probably didn't think twice about that I like jump for joy that my youngest does now. So just even understanding that and having people to celebrate with you um, 
that and understand that it is a big deal really helps to bring a lot of joy um, into this journey. And you know, one thing that we like to say is that there's you can still have some of these really hard feelings and it doesn't change how you feel about your child. So you can still say, yeah, I had a really hard day or, you know what, today I'm struggling with the fact that they have a disability um, or just, no, you know, being able to verbalize that you need a break, that you're experiencing appointment fatigue. We talk a lot about appointment fatigue. And sometimes when you need to just take a step back and say, you know what, I need to like lighten my load and maybe cancel a therapy here or there and know that it's not the end of the world. Um, it's okay to admit that you're anxious, that you're lonely, and that you're completely exhausted. <laughs> we, uh, I think sometimes we need to really vent about, about that. Um, but it, again, doesn't change how we feel about our children, and it's never complaining. It's just sometimes you need to just get some of that stuff off your chest. Um, so everybody always says to us, where can you find community? And it's not always as obvious as it seems, but there's basically a Facebook group for every type of disability out there. Um, you just have to find the right one. And I say that specifically because sometimes there's been groups that I've just had to leave because it just wasn't the right energy for me. Um, so I think knowing that to keep looking around and keep kind of feeling out the community a little bit before you really settle and say, these are my people, you know? Um, and I think you also have to take into consideration your own mental health. And like, there's um, some groups that are really heavy um, into, you know, the health side or, you know, there's a lot going on that sometimes I personally just take a step back from because I can absorb a lot of that stress, you know? So knowing when you need a break from even some of that connection. Um, there's lots of local organizations related to specific diagnoses. Um, again, sometimes you have to dig around a little bit or ask for word of mouth, ask even therapists and, and doctors and other people that you see. Um, if you do have your, if your children have like physical or occupational therapists, those are great people to talk to because they're in so many different households and families and chances are they've heard about some sort of group that's meeting or some uh, great place to reach out to. Um, there's a lot of national organizations. Um, we'd love for you to come find us and we can help you maybe point in the right direction of, um, of a disability that you, you know, specifically need to connect with. Um, my personal favorite in the Down syndrome community is the DSDN, the Down Syndrome Diagnosis Network. So if you do have a diagnosis of Down syndrome, they're a great organization to reach out to. And then there's a newer nonprofit called A Buddy Just Like Me, and their goal is to connect children and parents with people that have exactly the same diagnosis. Um, there, it was started by a mom in the cerebral palsy community, and she was ha she was struggling because she felt like, especially with cerebral palsy, there's so many different um, so many different layers of and so many different uh, ways that people can be affected by CP. So she was having a hard time finding someone just like them. So uh, she started this organization with the goal of connecting, and it's not just specific to CP, um, but the goal of connecting people who have specific diagnoses and building community that way, which is awesome. And then um, I've talked about this a lot. We, you've, you might find community, but it might take you a little while to connect and that's okay. Sometimes it takes a little while to be able to lean in and, and open up, but really when you can do that, that's when you get that best connection with people is when you kind of get a little more vulnerable yourself, you'll find that you get that deeper connection with, um, with other people. And giving support as a friend or family member. So this is, um, this is kind of talking from the opposite side of it. So if you, um, if a friend of yours or a family member their child gets a diagnosis of a disability, it's really important to set the stage from a language perspective as far as how to offer support. Um, a lot of times, and I think a lot of us who have a child with a disability, the first thing that we might have, that we might have heard when disclosing it to somebody is I'm sorry. Um, but a lot of times we don't need sympathy, um, especially like I got my daughter's diagnosis when I was pregnant. I was very excited about 
my daughter. I, well, I didn't need to hear, I'm sorry. Um, but I got, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, and you know, it's important to like hold space for and, and wait for the person to kind of say how they're feeling. Um, so some, we have some suggestions here of things that you can say instead of, I'm sorry, how are you feeling about everything? Maybe the person isn't ready for congratulations or, uh, you know, some sort of like overwhelmingly joyful, you know, they might be struggling. So maybe, so giving that space to, to let them tell you how they're feeling about everything is really important. Um, I would like to help support you. Please tell me how, when you feel ready. Um, I think sometimes when you're, when you're trying to understand a diagnosis yourself, it's hard to, to, you know, to be able to right away, tell somebody how they can help you, but just knowing that someone's there and waiting for you is, is really important. Um, and then I would love to learn more about this so I can understand your journey better and maybe offering that person some places to go to learn more about that disability. And then one of our favorite phrases is you've got this because I think everybody needs to just hear that they can handle what they're up against. Um, and then these are some of those tangible support things that I mentioned earlier on. So um, sometimes, you know, when someone's struggling with something, you'll say, you know, let me know how I can help you. But when you're in the, in the thick of it, you might not think of ways to, um, to tell that person, or we all still feel bad asking for help, right? So maybe showing up with a homemade meal or sending a, um, sending DoorDash to their house one day, um, and just taking that load off, um, providing some mother's helper or babysitting time, the person, depending on the disability, they might not feel comfortable leaving, um, or they might not be able to, or they might be in the thick of some health issues. Um, but maybe just coming over and saying, hey, go take a shower, or can I unload your dishwasher? Or can I take your other kids out to play for a little while? Um, but just kind of being there to be an extra adult to help. Um, do the food shopping. This is, this is a big one that we do sometimes for friends who um, their kids have a surgery or something. We'll, we'll Instacart a whole bunch of things so that the people still at the house can, can eat. Um, come by with tea or wine and just say, hey, let's talk. Just tell me everything, you know, tell me what you're feeling, tell me how things are going. And then avoid, but at least language. Um, so we talk about this, like, because sometimes people mean very well, but they might want to say, oh, but at least he's healthy, or at least this, or at least that. And it kind of minimizes the way that somebody is feeling. So just holding space, letting the person get whatever they need to get off their chest and not um, trying to dial it down at all. I'm just saying, you know, just being there and understanding. Um, disability parenting and the workplace. <laughs> um, I'm not going to go through each of these bullets, but um, we, you know, it's hard when you're trying to maintain a career and you have a child with a lot of um, health issues. Um, but I think the more that you can be transparent um, to your superiors when you're working, um, and then also um, on the flip side, if you're a manager somewhere and you have a parent who has a child with a disability on your team, just how to be more um, understanding and maybe work things out with them a little bit differently. Um, but from the employee side, just being open and honest with your superiors about what you need to do, um, being present where you are in that moment. So sometimes like if I'm working, I need to just say, I'm working, I can't do anything about what's going on at home. So I'm just gonna focus on, on working. Um, being a little more intentional about mapping out the week on a Sunday, I sit down for like 15 minutes or more and just say like, okay, what do we have going on this week? And um, you know, just avoiding some of those like overlaps and conflicts. Um, and then getting involved in some groups in your workplace can really help and help people understand um, a little bit more about parenting a child with a disability. Um, and then communicating to your medical and therapy team about your multiple priorities. So um, it's hard when you're a working parent and if you you know, if you have therapists who maybe need to move appointments around a lot and you need to say like, I, this is, I can't, that's, I can't be that flexible, unfortunately, because I do have to balance this, um, you know, my, my career. Um, and then, you know, on the manager side, 
one of the big points that I want to hit is just not assuming that somebody has too much going on and passing, you know, we've had a lot of people in our communities who have said they were passed over for a promotion because their boss just assumed that they had too much going on. Um, so just being open and having like a back and forth dialogue about where the person is in that, in that moment. And respite, my favorite topic. Um, so in a perfect world, any of us would have time for date nights, exer daily exercise, the you know perfect healthy food and lots of breaks, but it's not the reality for most parents in general. And then especially when you add that element of having a child with a disability, um, it can sometimes feel next to impossible. Um, time is, is often the restriction and then money is often the restriction. It's very, it can be, it can be a lot more expensive to have a child with a disability. So you might have to give up some of the things that you used to do because you're paying for something on the medical side. Um, so these are some of my favorite quick wins that require little time and little money. Um, so yoga and meditation, as I mentioned, um, is a big part of my life and there is a ton of free and virtual content that's out there. So if you can dedicate yourself to maybe after bedtime, uh, you know, spending some time doing some yoga, or maybe get up a little bit earlier than everybody, um, it's a, it, it takes dedication, but you don't need a babysitter to, to do yoga at home. And like I said, there's lots of free lots of free things available. Um, taking a walk and listening to a podcast. So kind of just zoning out and, um, you know, maybe doing like learning or whatever helps to stimulate your brain. Um, taking a spa shower. So I never like when people say like that a shower itself is self-care, but there's ways that you can add, you can spice up a shower <laughs> to um, make it a lot more relaxing. Um, so, you know, adding some essential oils, putting music on, doing a face mask and just taking a little bit longer and making it relaxing and maybe even making it like a Sunday night ritual or something. Um, trade babysitting hours with another family and go to dinner if you can. Um, I like the trading hours thing because it's, you know, it kind of works for both sides and it saves a lot of money. Um, Commit to reading 10 minutes every night before bed, just adding a little bit into your routine and maybe drinking some chamomile tea to help yourself fall asleep easier. Um, spending time outside with no devices, just noticing nature. This is a nice little meditation tool to just sit outside and pay attention to five things you can hear or five things you can see um, and just relaxing your mind a little bit that way. Um, and then add breaks to your calendar, even if they're only 15 minutes. So just taking little bits of time throughout the day and maybe just sitting with a cup of tea or enjoying your coffee hot and just finding those little ways to, um, to take a break. So that's the presentation side of it, but um, I would love to have some more discussion around anything we talked about. I put um, both of the Instagram handles here if anybody would like to connect with me as well. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. I love the aspect of kind of taking breaks from appointments. Yes. And, and as a therapist, I think we all need breaks sometimes yes. and that is so important. So, yes, I think it's important to, we all feel so guilty, I think doing something like that, but if we're, bur if we're burning out, you can only imagine our child is probably burning out as well. <laughs> So it's nice to just say, you know what, I'm going to take a week off or maybe longer. <laughs> yeah. I think the world, the world keeps turning. <laughs> and let's practice these skills in the real world, especially mm -hmm. I'm a speech therapist by trade. Um, we go communicate with someone at Target, go to the okay. park. Um, yep. That's a great way to practice those communication skills in yeah. the real world. It's great that you can communicate with me, but I'm not cool. Right. Uh, let's, right. let's practice with people your own age or, or caregivers or other family members. Yeah. Um, so I think this is, I think a lot of this is also helpful for clinicians. I think yes. just taking time and taking breaks. Um, okay is so important. Yes. So I'm trying to see if we have any questions. Tana, do we have anything from Facebook? 
Okay. So we have one question that came in. How do other parents determine how much time to spend focusing, focus, focusing on communication with their child? How to find the balance between frustration and supportive and encouragement? Um, I'm not sure if that's more geared to like as a clinician or as a parent. Um, maybe Taryn, you could kind of touch on like how to find the balance between, I'm sure that there's times of just being frustrated um, and how to find that balance. I kind of just, I always follow my daughter's cue. You know, when she says that we're done, <laughs> Like we're, you know, we're done. I'm not going to keep pushing her. And, you know, luckily my, our therapists are, they know her very well now too. And they know if we're going to, you know, if we're going to push her, um, it's just going to get worse and worse. So we, um, you know, we work a lot of play into the therapies. Uh, so sometimes we'll just stop and say like, okay, let's let her color for a few minutes and just kind of reset that, that time. Um, and, or maybe it's like, let's change the scenery. Now that the weather's nicer, we're in New Jersey. Now that the weather's nicer, like let's go out on the patio, let's move therapy outside and, you know, and just change the scene. So I think it's important to, and, and there's been times where we've called, you know, an hour long therapy after 30 minutes. Cause we're like, this is not going to work. And just understanding that and, you know, and not being afraid to step away. I think in understanding that they are, you're, your daughter is a person and she yeah. has a voice and it should be recognized yeah. and acknowledged. Um, so, okay. Another question came in. Um, how do you help others in the family, extended family, like grandma or grand or aunts understand a unique, unique child in the family? I think I need some speech therapy. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's tough because I think um, I think there's a lot of, especially as things have changed so drastically in the disability community, even over 10 years, 20 years. Um, I mean, in my lifetime, children with Down syndrome were almost immediately institutionalized. You know, it was like 30, 35 years ago where that was the more common thing to do. And, and here, here we are in such a different place in, in only that amount of time which, um, so I think where the hardest thing for me with family has been just breaking down some of those preconceived notions about how much has changed and just, and, and nobody's fortunately in my own family, nobody has ever been negative intentionally. It's just bringing in some of those things that they understood, um, and even language that was totally appropriate a couple decades ago. Um, so I've always liked gentle, like gentle communication with people because I feel like if I'm like, if I'm getting mad at, at somebody for saying something the wrong way or asking a question that's a little bit ignorant every time, they're gonna be less and less willing to learn from me and less and less willing to ask questions. So I've always used like gentle advocacy where, you know, I'm like, we prefer to say it this way. Um, I understand that that's the way it was always said, but we prefer it this way rather than like getting, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of people who just get angry <laughs> right away. And that just doesn't help anything. And I think when you take time to explain why something is different. Um, it helps people want to change more. So, and I think just involving people in, in as much of the processes as, as possible and just um, being open about your whole journey can help, can help some family members as well. Yeah. I feel like you might have touched on this, but is there anything that us as clinicians can help to empower families? Um, yeah. Because um, in some ways, especially 
if you're doing early intervention, you're in the home. Um, so you yeah. are in these families' homes and in their safe spaces. Um, I see children in a clinic setting, but just, you know, we often have these relationships um, yeah. and do see people weekly and just have, have a help empower families, yet not, um, we don't want to cross that boundary of professionalism either, but when you see that someone maybe could have, could benefit from some help or just how to empower. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, um, I think a lot of therapy, every therapist I've met is very good at like picking up on when somebody might be struggling. And I think just like knowing when to step in and say like, Hey, you're doing a great job or, Hey, this is what, you know, this, like maybe picking out some things that are working really well, or that, you know, that they're working really hard on. Um, even if like, you're having a, a rough go, <laughs> like, let's say it's a rough appointment or like you've been stuck on a milestone for a long time and you can feel that frustration, maybe just offering that encouragement of gosh, but you guys have come so far. Think about where we were six months ago. Or, um, you know, there was one time when I was, it was early on in getting in my daughter, having physical therapy. And we, you know, I just felt like I was in that feeling like I was, like I wasn't practicing that much, you know, in between therapies. And I just, I felt like I was starting every therapy session for a while, like apologizing. Like I was like, we just had such a busy week. We had so much going on. We really didn't, weren't working on this, blah, blah. And, you know, one day the, phys, my physical therapist was like, she's like, everything that is going on around you is therapy. Cause we have three, you know, older daughters, they're constantly playing with her. They're constantly motivating her. She's modeling them all, you know? So she was kind of just like a very gently, like, you're fine. <laughs> you know, because she's like, all of this that's going on, because my daughters were like all running around. She's like, all of this is that practice that you think you're not doing, you know, and she said it right when I needed to hear that. So I think just picking up on some of those cues and knowing when to like, give the parent a pat on the back. Um, even if like, even if it may be like, on the back end of something that you had to tell them they need to work a little harder on, but say, you know what, but you're doing an amazing job on, you know, this, that, and the other. <laughs> yeah. And then one more. Um, do you, what are some, what are your tips for taking first steps after a diagnosis is provided? Yeah, that's a good one. So first step would be to just give yourself time to absorb. I think Initially, I spent a ton of time Googling about Down syndrome. And to be honest, it was like probably the worst thing that I can do because could do at the time because there's just so much information, a lot of statistics, a lot of medical information. And again, like I've said, so much has changed in the last uh, couple decades that all of that old information is still out there. So I think just giving yourself time to just sit with it for a little bit, but the first thing that I would say to do is look for community, look for connection, whether that's social media, whether it's searching some hashtags. Um, it took me a little while to get to social media with, with my daughter's diagnosis, but that was like the first place where I found joy and I found uh, relief. So I would say when you're ready, um, find some community and just connect with people message somebody who has this, a similar diagnosis and say, you know, Hey, can I chat with you? Or, um, you know, can, what would you suggest? Where would you suggest I go to learn some more information? Um, but just taking it one step at a time and not overwhelming yourself. There was some articles that people would send me or the genetic counselor sent me that I would just start reading and get completely overwhelmed. And I just wasn't ready to kind of dive in on a lot of that. So um, one step at a time for sure. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, another one from the registration. After my child was diagnosed, we received so many recommendations of what to do. And it was very overwhelming. How do you make decisions? How do you make, sorry, how do you make decisions to balance 
um, to balance all the appointments, therapies, et cetera, activities? Yeah. Um, I remember, I remember feeling like, I remember feeling that within the first couple of weeks of my daughter arriving, just getting bombarded with, well, you have to do this. You have to do that. You have to do this. Um, and I hate to keep coming back to the phrase, take one step at a time, but it felt like a mountain to climb. And I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to do anything else? I'm just going to be at appointments, you know, all day, every day. <laughs> I was like, I don't know how I'm going to, you know, do anything. And I think with, with therapies, starting one at a time, getting a good routine going with one and then maybe adding another, but also knowing when to say, you know what, I can't, I can't add that one right now. Um, and just knowing that it's, it sounds like it, it sounds, um, facetious maybe or something, but, um, it will all work itself out because I, I, like I said, I thought that was all I was going to be doing. And now, you know, even now we have three to four appointments a week. Um, and it just works. It somehow just winds up working and you get, you get used to it. Um, make the, always make the decisions about what's right for your family. And you don't have to worry about this person does six therapies a week and I'm only doing three, you know, you'll know your child and you'll know what you need to step up and step down a little bit. Um, and that could change, that could change every little bit anyway. So, um, not worrying about, I, like I have friends who are in twice as many therapies and appointments than I am. And sometimes I'm like, oh, am I doing the wrong thing? But <laughs> my daughter's thriving, you know, we're, we're making the decisions on what's right for our family because we have three other kids to balance as well. So, yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how Extra Wealthy Moms came to be? Yes. Oh, I kind of skipped over that, but yes. Um, so we founded Extra Lucky Moms because the Down syndrome community is beautiful and huge and um, such a joyful place and so welcoming. But Jess and I, my partner Jess and I both had uh, friends with different diagnoses um, for their children who were like, oh my gosh, I actually wish I was in the Down syndrome community because you guys have so much, you know, so much, so many resources and so much community and all of that. And we were like, what is, why are we doing like, why is like everything have to be in a box? Because we all, I might not understand what it's like to raise a child with autism or to raise a child with cerebral palsy, but there's so many things that are more uh, similar about all of us than are different, you know? So we just thought, why don't we bring everybody together? <laughs> Everybody's welcome. <laughs> if, if you have, like we have, um, we have moms in our community that have their children have like a micro deletion of a chromosome um, that there was, there's one organization that we've worked with um, that the disability was only discovered. And I think it was like 2017 and their community is only a few hundred people. So literally globally, a few hundred people have this disability. And, um, but again, like we can understand so much of what they go through. There's a lot that's different, but there's so much that's the same. And we've found that we learn so much and we love sharing and teaching everybody else about all of these different disabilities too, because it, it just, when you understand things more, you don't fear them. Um, and I think that that's so much of the uh, adversity that our children face is because people don't understand. So the more that we can spread the message that, hey, we're all actually more alike than we are different, um, the better that the whole world can be. <laughs> yeah. okay. um, one other question we got was, do you have any tips on advocating for school support? Um, my daughter's only two, a little over That's two. That's what I thought. She's still little. However, I, I have three older children. My oldest is graduating fifth grade. Um, next week. And what I've found in general works really well is getting involved in school as much as you can. And again, I, a lot of this was when I was working full-time, I had a full-time corporate job. I still found ways 
to volunteer. Like I signed up for the one committee that could be done from my computer. <laughs> like I, everything about the committee was like, you know, online. So I was like, okay, I don't have a lot of time to be physically present, but um, I can still be involved in the school. And especially now with, um, with COVID, a lot of board of ed meetings are virtual. A lot of home and school and PTA meetings are virtual. So um, even if you don't have a lot of time or can't get out of the house a lot, getting involved um, is huge because um, you learn so much about the school, you learn so much about the district, and then people are more willing to stand up alongside of you when, you know, when they know you and respect you and appreciate you. So um, I would say, I don't, like I said, I'm, I'm about to, my, my daughter will be three in, um, in March next year. So I'm like just starting to dip my toes into, <laughs> into the school situation. Um, so I will come back in a few years and talk about it more, but um, that would be my advice in general is to get involved as much as possible, show up to things, ask how you can help, um, ask the teachers what they need, ask the principal what they need. Um, it's the best way to have people wanna fight for you in the future. Okay, we got one more question um, from Laura. She says, how do you connect which social media, media and what ways and limits? You cut out a little bit, so do you Yeah, to sorry, that's okay. So Laura asks, um, how do you connect which social media and what ways and limits? Um, so maybe Laura can give us a little bit more information of what she's looking for. Um, cause I know you guys are on Instagram and yeah. Facebook as well. Yeah. So as far as like connecting on Instagram, um, it's often like through messaging back and forth. Um, and then we do some virtual and in-person events. So where we get to actually like meet, you know, meet our families, um, with, Facebook, a lot of times it's private Facebook groups. And you have, like, again, you have to decide what works for you as far as sharing um, and making sure that you understand like the privacy of the group and feeling comfortable sharing certain information. Um, but there's a lot of organizations like the Down Syndrome Diagnosis Network that I mentioned. Um, their Facebook groups are highly monitored. They have, you know, they make sure that parents can feel safe in them. So there's a lot of other types of organizations like that, but the best thing to do with Facebook is just search the disability, you know, and see what you find and, you know, read about the groups and find out, you know, about their rules and all of that. Um, and, you know, like I said, feel, you know, feel the group out a little bit and make sure that it's, it, you know, it feels like the right space for you to share. Thanks so much. We'll see if we get any other questions that come through. Okay. Um, we had another question. She said, I work with many families who have more than one child. What tips do you have on navigating disability in your family with typical siblings? Um, I assume you mean talking to the, ch the child. Um, Maybe. Um, Sorry, yeah, I'm just reading the message. No, it's fine. So I guess I can answer this in two ways. First yeah. of all, from um, from like a therapy perspective, I, I try to involve my other girls as much as possible, and they know that they can always like jump in and you know participate. Our therapists are great about that um, because I never want to be like, no, 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 this is this is Raya's therapy, like stay, you know, stay away kind of thing. I want them to be included and a part of it. Um, and then as far as um, talking to them about the disability, that's, that's really been a journey that we've let happen sort of organically. We did, we did um, read my two oldest daughters. They were, when we got Raya's diagnosis, um, they were eight and six. So we read them some kid-friendly books about Down syndrome, just so that we wanted to be able to talk about Down syndrome as much as possible. And kids, like adults, but kids especially make up their own story in their head about something when you don't explain it to them. So we were very open with them from the beginning. 
Raya also needed surgery when she was two months old. Um, she needed heart surgery. So um, there was a lot that was going to be different about her being a newborn that we wanted them. We didn't want them to be scared and think that, you know, um, that, you know, that everything had changed. So we were very open with them about that. And then we've just let them know that they can always ask questions and they do. And sometimes they'll come to us and, you know, ask a question that just popped into their head about Down syndrome. Um, we've also, uh, like this past World Down Syndrome Day, I read to, I read to their classes. I did a presentation for the fifth grade um, so that their peers could learn a little bit more. And they were able to ask me questions and they had great questions as well. I loved, especially the second grade, they had awesome questions, but fifth grade had really, uh, really intelligent questions. Um, so we've been very open um, so that the kids could learn alongside of us so that they could, um, you know, again, not make up stories in their, in their head. And they are very proud of their sister. And sometimes they're like, we don't understand what the big deal is. And I'm like, that's the whole point is it's not, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, um, you know, we do, we do talk to them a lot about it. And, you know, we've, they've now gotten to meet a lot more families in the disability community that have older children and uh, come to different events. And, you know, we did a walk for Down syndrome in last October. So they got to go to that and we kind of make it a family affair, all of it. Um, another question we had is guidance on balancing attention when so much occupies your life for a child with special needs. Yes. Um, we've, you know, the fortunate thing is if you could find a fortunate thing about COVID when we, um, Raya was born two weeks after like the pandemics, she was born in late March, 2020. So we had a lot of quality time and, um, we've now had to get back into being now that schedules are back to normal and all of that, we've had to get more intentional about making sure that we have individual time um, with everybody, but that's again, part of, like I said before, about including them in whatever they want to be included in, um, balancing, like, uh, because I have a big family, I have to be intentional about how much I sign the kids up for so that we're not just running in a million different directions all, all the time. So I try to make sure that, you know, everybody has like one activity a season, and um, so that way we have at least a few nights at home that we're, <laughs> that we're just having dinner together um, and making sure that we have enough family time on the weekends. Um, but it, it is a balance. You have to just find that sweet spot of what you know, each, each child needs to feel seen. Thank you. I don't have any other questions right now, so we'll give it a couple minutes, see okay. if anything um, comes in from Facebook Live. But thank you so much for yeah, all your information. Fun. Is there yeah. anything we can do to help with your organization? If you just want to follow us on Instagram, we always, like I said, if you're if you are in the New Jersey, New York area, we do do some in-person events. We're hoping to roll some like some satellite ones out because we have a lot of moms like all over the country who are like, I'll host an event. So um, we're hoping to do that at some point. Um, but yeah, we always have a lot going on. We also do a lot of things like this. So if anybody works at a company and they, you know, they need a present, you know, they need us to come and talk about, you know, that for any of the diversity and inclusion initiatives that a lot of companies have, um, we're also available for things like that. So a um, lot, of, lot of things on our website and um, on Instagram. We're always sharing new diagnoses, sharing different families, um, and having fun. <laughs> I think fun is the important. That's that's yeah. life, and just being a kid and being a family. Exactly, um, yeah. I think is important. So, okay, yeah, we were saying we got some. Um, we love the idea of the satellite groups. And kind yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. But I think, like I said, I've always liked from your, um, your organization's post that it's real life, um, yeah. that sometimes, you know, you, the kids are covered in paint or kids are yep. covered in food. Like that is life. There's no perfection. 
<laughs> yeah, sometimes you have pants on, sometimes you don't. Um, but yeah. that's okay. That's like yeah. That's yeah. the real side of things. We have, and um, we, have to laugh, we have to laugh along the way, you know, and there's, everything doesn't have to be so serious all the time, so. Exactly, yep. exactly. I think that's the, um, social media is awesome, but I think sometimes you don't see people's authentic selves. Exactly, yep. Yep. being able to take that into consideration as well. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think that's it for tonight okay. then. Okay. Thanks Thank so you much. so much. Yes. Thanks for having me. And again, we're, we're all over Instagram. So come, come join the party. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Everyone have a great evening.